Too bad for you. Hello? The whole time? Yeah. What? Oh, does it shut up? These are very tough conditions. No, it didn't go. I didn't shut it all the way. I just, it's close. I just, yeah. Well, good evening and welcome to Sayark. I read the quizzical title, you may have seen it, of Wes Jones's lecture this evening with great anticipation. I want to speculate on what the title The Machine Rules might imply and suggest to you several interpretive venues for the upcoming ubiquitous machine. Single-minded, sometimes powerful architecture can originate in both private experience and from broader, collectively held paradigms that subsume a particular theoretical premise and re-offer it as a form language for architecture. Tonight, we will be asked to consider the machine as the embodiment of a view of contemporary history, and by implication, a prognosis of the world to come. From the gallery of machines to Marcel Lodes and John Prouvé, from Pete Cook, Warren Chalk, and Ron Heron, to Pompidou, Lloyds, and the Shanghai Bank, a visual idealization of technique, first tentative and unbuilt, next a fragile conception at a small scale in a world that saw it as both unwelcome intrusion and unfounded speculation, to the current self-assured spectacle of large-scale construction. A once tenuous conception has often become the corporate embodiment of fiscal potency and up-to-date imaging. Which machine are we investigating? The speculative stumbling adventure from early in the 20th century or its corporate coronation at the end? Does the machine rule, does the machine rules mean we all serve the machine? Or does it suggest that we are simply here tonight to learn the rules according to which the machine operates? Are we representing the results of mechanized technique which spans rivers, builds to the sky, splits the atom, flies the continents, and imagines both surgery and war as long-distance video? Or are we grafting on the look, the image of technique, and the style of the tool that, as a commentator once noted, costs a thousand dollars a square foot to make a museum look like an oil rig in the North Sea? An anecdotal recollection in 1979, the American president, Jimmy Carter, sent the most sophisticated of American helicoptering machines to the Iranian desert to rescue Americans imprisoned in the embassy in Tehran. Sand, mere grains of sand, got into the propellers. The failed and the helicopters, now rusted hunks of steel, were exuberantly displayed by the Iranians. Technique succeeds, technique fails. The machines on that historical occasion in the Iranian desert belong to a purpose and a symbolism that is almost entirely absent from architecture's long, unadulterated, adulation. 
Le Corbusier's lament, they build cars on an assembly line, why don't we build houses the same way? omits a significant portion of a history substantially more varied than the architecture as a machine for living storyline represents. Perhaps the question tonight is not to confirm whether the machine rules, but to question whose rules rule the machine. Please welcome Wes Jones to SciArc. Well, I'd like to thank you all for having me here tonight and thank Eric for a uh, extremely well-considered uh, introduction. I'm really uh, honored that he took the time and trouble to put that sort of effort into it. Uh, can I have the first two slides? Um, I decided to give this talk tonight rather than the talk about newness that I have been giving lately at other places for obvious reasons. And it sounds like that may have been a good, a good thing. Now I'd like you to understand the talk tonight as sort of half a critique of some current formalist trends and half as an exhortation or reminder of the basicness of the mechanical to our experience on this planet. And beginning, before getting to the rules of the title and actually engaging the discussion that Eric started about what that title might mean, I'd like to set a little context with some images of our earlier work and make some general comments. Uh, can I have the first, uh, I mean the next slide? Now the world for this work can be set up with a few key ideas, or if you prefer, beliefs of ours. And first and most basic among those, I think, is that every thing made is a machine by virtue of the intentionality that gets it made. Architecture as a concept, as an institution, is a machine. Buildings are machines. They can't help it. Even language is a machine in this sense. Thus there are only three things in the world in the end. Us, nature, and the machines we make to keep us company and mediate the natural. Next. Second, our reality is physical. And at the scale at which we may experience it, it is ultimately, finally, and inescapably Newtonian or mechanical. We are bodies in space, and we can't help that either. Now, we can experience a single photon, photon but that experience is quite impoverished, and there's not a whole lot we can do with that. Next. Third, machines are inherently legible. Since such legibility is hardwired into us by evolution within the universe that I described above. Next. Fourth, though the legibility of, or rather through the legibility of that world, we are drawn into engaging experience in that world. Next. As the most physically significant embodiment of our understanding of our place in that world, architecture should promote such engaging experience, we believe. Next. And all of this imposes limits on meaningful engagement. In contrast to how we usually think of it, that is, in superlative terms, architecture institutionalizes this sense of limit as a notion of less than. Next. It's less than art, for example, because it's constrained by function. Next. 
And it's even less finely than building, because it is building only in a particular way. Next. And this means, finally, that architecture most significantly is less than possible. Now what I mean by that is that out of all possible form that's available to us, beyond even which we may, we may understand, we still choose narrowly that form that we may call architecture. Now as Eric hinted at, there's a number of different ways that you can take this title here. For me, I was thinking in terms of, admittedly, the idea of the machine as being the best. Given the alternates, pragmatically considered, the machine rules, dude. <laughs> then also, there is the inescapable sense of the machine as that which orders or striates or scales the world. An aspect of the machine that has been criticized, of course, at great length by uh, very notable uh, critics and philosophers. And then finally, the sense of it that I'll be spending the most time talking about tonight, or rather, let's say we'll structure the talk tonight, is the idea that the machine does confer rules on production, and that we can look to those rules as a way of guiding that production and making sure that it is the best that it can possibly be. Now, the idea behind this rule is, the, is that everything comes from somewhere. Can I have the next slides, by the way? Like it or not, everything is ensnared in history. And history will judge us and everything else, whether we like it or not. We are ensnared in history as users and as readers. And it's by mastering the conventions and the traditions that come down to us through history that we are able to promote the greatest legibility. And knowing the manual makes the work better, finally, as meaning and understanding makes the world more rich and interesting. But this doesn't mean in knowing the manual that you have to accept it across the board. It doesn't mean that you can't be critical. This project of ours for a, uh, a tower in uh, San Francisco serves, uh, uh, enacts a critique of the uh, Seagram's building that you have seen in the uh, images on the left. An aspect of the Seagram's building that you don't appreciate usually is that it has this little backpack on the back, so it's not the most perfect prismatic form. In the Dominion Center in Toronto, uh, he finally, in my sense, got it right and, allow, and got the, the core into the interior and made the prismatic form perfect. But in the Seagram's building, which everybody kind of touts as the most idealized uh, sense of the tower uh, program, the tower form, uh, it's got this silly little backpack on there that in the previous slide you may have seen here just was poking out just at the edge, but you never really see that. They certainly don't focus on that. Now playing by and with the book places you in the toughest arena of judgment. This is the bigs. This is where the best architects in history are on your review or on your jury. And this tower is our entry in that field. It's much more fun to play when you've got judges like this looking over your shoulder than if you're just kind of making it up out of thin air or trying to break, quote, new ground all the time for which there is no ability to judge, no ability to decide whether what you're doing is good or cool or correct or anything else. Now in our minds, a tower, and I think history would, uh, would agree, the tower is the noblest of modernity's contributions to the historical catalog of form. It's the clearest statement of the unique capabilities of contemporary building practice. As a technical achievement, or as a natural and direct condensation of economic forces and real estate dynamics, 
The tower is a remarkable feat of will and expression. Considering the resources it consumes both during its production and continuously afterwards, the traffic it generates, the people it houses, and the business interests it advances, the tower is a big deal. The other half of the historical context for our project is what became of Mises' example. Sorry, I, I went ahead too much on the labels. Okay, let's keep it here for a little bit. The typical tower design is more a result of construction, economics, and leasing formulas than design will. And this, but this is, this is interestingly, this is where Mies started and where he would say he finished. But how he treated those conditions, we think, is essentially different. It makes all the difference between what we see around us nowadays. The speculative uh, office tower inherits the massing, but it inherits little of the pride, uh, the good or evil, of its forebears. It cannot avoid the statement of exceptionality that its investment must represent, but at the same time it serves an equation that values a sort of anonymous conformity. Uh, can we go forward here? Slides? Now this project is, uh, uh, was done at the corner of uh, 2nd Street and Howard Street in, in, at the intersection there in San Francisco. It has a 50 by 80 foot um, uh, floor plate or footprint and it's three exposed frontages um, which minus a setback for the sway which uh, is an incredibly cool idea that you would have to actually set the building back from the property lines to allow for it to move in space. Uh, the scheme has um, uh, an auto lift at the lobby. Can we have the next one? Uh, and it and it nets and it and it uh, works out at about um, ninety thousand square feet gross. Can I have the next? Here you can see a plan on the left there at the lobby level. Uh, basically, uh, you can see how the core is organized to the back on the interior lot line. Here's an image of the lobby on the left. And on the right there in the plan, uh, the corner is, is sort of on the left and top there. Uh, on the right there in the plan is the auto lift that gets the cars down into the uh, basement. Next. Included on it are four floors of luxury residential units, above 15 floors of uh, what we call very small plate commercial. And because the plate is so small, it ends up being uh, column free which is obviously a big advantage in the real estate uh, market. And the core, as I mentioned, is slung along the interior lot line, which is on the bottom there in the plan. And as we were working this out, what was interesting to us is how all of the pieces of the puzzle legislated by codes, and my studio will appreciate this, um, begin to kind of design the thing for you, or at least direct you into a a design in such a way that there is no other possible alternative. It's what I would call the mystery of the stairs working out perfectly. They are half the distance of the diagonal and when you put the, the bathrooms on the outside in order to get the exposure, there's absolutely no other way you can fit all the stuff in there. And it comes out to like the inch and it, and it more or less designs itself. And that seems like a totally remarkable thing to me. Next. And that is the manual basically in operation. It's basically the accumulated wisdom of so many years of doing these things has resulted in the set of rules that come to us as constraints in the code, as constraints in structural issues, uh, environmental HVAC and that sort of thing. And stuff happens, but if you attend to the will of these things, as Mies would say, uh, you know, it's a bit romantic, then the thing comes together. And it comes together in a potentially really cool way. The, uh, on the exterior, the skin is basically a continuous aluminum curtain wall with varying light opacity uh, as you go up from the bottom to the top, so it's not all the same, um, same kind of glass. And it has these extruded aluminum sunshade louvers um, all on the ex exposed on the exterior structural uh, brace frame. And all this stuff kind of diffuses out toward the top. You may be able to remember from the preceding uh, slides. 
And then we also have this uh, back backpack kind of core condition that we've expressed on the back, uh, both because of the fact uh, that the way the real estate dynamics work out and the creation of the floor plate, and the fact that this is on the interior lot line, we're not really able to have any windows on this side. This allows us to have a 20 floor uh, uh, more or less blank and therefore possibly sculptural wall. Each floor has uh, package HVAC units and you can see the um, exhaust um, uh, uh, for them uh, uh, marching up the sides here and they're basically stuck on top of the um, bathrooms because the floor heights are much higher because of the because of the smaller floor plates, so we're able to actually stack them on top of the bathroom there. But it has a centralized chiller plant and boiler on the roof and uh, at the level right above the lobby, uh, which uh, we expose in the lobby. If Next. Uh, here's the, on the left there, you see the car lift. Um, and on the right, you can see the, lo the entry into the car lift area from uh, uh, Howard Street uh, and the lobby beyond. The um, boiler is actually uh, in the ceiling space above the lobby and we have a glass ceiling which I think the next set of slides uh, will show us. And everything is visible from the lobby. That kind of sets up the, uh, the, the way the thing works. The, both uh, the d spatial divisions between the core and the main um, column free space and the louvers and curtain wall come down to the ground there. And you can see the glass ceiling. Uh, there are uh, segmented and rolling overhead uh, garage doors that kind of cruise across the ceiling top uh, to uh, shield that uh, in certain uh, cases and conditions. Next. This is a, another a typical floor plan uh, or floor uh, office layout. You can see in this case uh, uh, we have cut through for a double height space because this was designed for this sort of dot-com startup which is another reason why it didn't get built. Uh, there, was a, there was a sense that um, there would have to be a lot of interfloor communication as these, these things kind of spin off from each other and found other places in the building uh, to exist. Next. Finally, the idea of the tower for us was in architecture it is the biggest, most complex architectural machine. Um, and we've, we tried in our design here to kind of take all the traditional elements in the tower that are given to us by, say, Mies um, primarily, and rethink them from within the perspective of the mechanical metaphor. That is, to try to understand it finally as a machine. So therefore, we have done things like expose the curtain wall as a planar surface rather than trying to hide it as a box, as a series of planes around it so it actually extends out past to the depth of the uh, louvers on the left there, as you can see, and then spent a lot of time um, working out the mechanical uh, on the top there along with the, uh, the um, helipad. And the idea was that as the louvers kind of disappeared as it went higher in the sky and the building diffused up into the sky, it would ki finally culminate in the mist rising off of the cooling towers there toward the top. Next. And there are two ways to look at this rule, this obvious but actually fairly profound truth. One is the way that you're probably most familiar with, the idea of efficiency, the idea of this sort of, this sort of thinking uh, conveying a certain rightness to stuff. Um, the idea that machines have no superfluous parts. Uh, the old joke about opening the thing and it's saying it may require some assembly or batteries not uh, included uh, is related to this kind of thinking about um, the machine and the fact that every part is there for a specific reason. And then of course the additional joke about after you've ended up fixing something around the house or something and you have done it so well that you actually have a few parts left over at the end. And finally in architecture we understand this mostly as the idea that form follows function. Next. But there's another way to look at it as well. And that is that functions, the idea of function, the idea that the parts have significance, that functions can be conjured up in the person of the parts to give form, to create form. So that we begin to see every bit, every part, every element as a potential site 
than for engagement. And every site of engagement becomes, in that sort of way of thinking, a site, a potential site for invention. Uh, in this particular case for this project, these things down here at the bottom are actually the beds, which are able to also work as couches. Uh, and it's basically a hammock structure slung within uh, the building as a whole, which will become more evident in the later slides. Next. Now when every part counts, then every orientation or context counts as well. And every place becomes a place to be. So the relationship or the a priori kind of given relationship to the ground becomes suspended on the interior, as you saw in the previous slides, or critiqued perhaps on the exterior. Now this project is a project located in Brisbane, California, which is a small hillside community south of San Francisco. Uh, next. The, it's a sloping site. It borders a, a dense oak forest at the uppermost edge of the existing development in the area. The downhill view in this project, which is a house, um, is into the backyards of the neighbors and therefore less desired, while the best views are out to the sides in either direction along the line of the um, oak forest. And the client preferred the house to have a minimal impact on the site. Next. The client lives in a, lo a loft downtown presently, and he likes that kind of way of, uh, of living. And so we basically made another big open space for him. It's basically just a big tube, a big simple tube, but it's been flexed and twisted to conform more closely to the sloping contours of the site. Next. And these contours work their way into the interior of the house in the living area, which you see in this image here. Um, and that living area is actually sloped, like the contours on the outside. The client likes a spare space, so what we thought was we would take the sloping floor, which we've drawn into the building from the exterior, and uh, make it out of a fine hardwood, and, and so it's able to actually take the place of the furniture. So the client actually hangs out on the floor, uh, rather than ha cluttering it up with a bunch of object furniture. One reason for saying that is because obviously we've already cluttered it up with our architecture. Next. Next. Into this loft kind of shell idea, we've uh, placed a, what we call in our office a hermit crab, uh, functional support elements. Um, these are sort of similar to the core strategy, wet core strategy, um, uh, that you probably are familiar with in traditional modernism. So can you see in the section on the left, uh, these various sort of curvilinear shapes, these are um, uh, defined by these uh, rolling overhead uh, door, uh, garage door constructions on these frames here that actually uh, define the private areas that uh, around a series of platforms that are slung into the space there that act as the bedrooms and in one case as the office. And because the idea here, the divisions of, of space here are spatial, next, um, there are no uh, walls in the conventional sense, rather all the divisions are sectional. Uh, made up by these, uh, the, these yellow frames. And then slung along the ramp that kind of organizes and bisects the sloping floor space, uh, which you could see in the slide on the left in the upper triangular portion, from the slung platforms on the lower portion in the rectangular area, there's this long ramp that sort of connects them all, are these uh, more traditional modernist uh, wet core type elements that include those parts of the program like the bathrooms and closets and such that we're not so happy to be exposed around the sides of these um, uh, these sliding, uh, these rolling overhead door uh, spatial divisions. Next. This is uh, the entry condition. You enter in under the large form as you can see from the exterior on the left and you enter into this space here and you begin ramping up on on the right in the in the perspective there and and the first platform you see is, is above you there. This is, the, you know, the block is the part of the building that actually touches down into the ground. Next. 
There is a sort of theme of obliquity, you might say, that is encouraged in this kind of uh, uh, emphasis uh, on the significance of each part so that you, you begin to get the sleeving and interrelationship of the various systems that begin to suggest uh, different kinds of entries and openings into the exterior of which uh, this is an example as you slide down in the triangular space on your left which is a living area and finally uh, get the ramp gets high enough you can duck underneath or duck outside there. Next. Now if each part is significant, and if there's a reason for it, then it's also the center of a web of relationships that extend beyond it. And by that, what I mean to imply is that each part points to an entire world. Each part has a history. Each part has inherent in it a depth and a richness that goes beyond its own physical presence. And through this kind of realization, it seems to me you should be able to extend the design sense into the program, understanding of course as well that the idea of program itself is a machine, and begin to engage ideas that have come down to us through modern architectural history, uh, for example, such as the servant-served relationships, different modes of deployment of elements, of parts. Um, these are all ways in which functions can be conjured out of the, this telling of stories in relationship to the part in order to give you more excuses for designing stuff. And then finally that richness ultimately can be appreciated in the thing there. Next. Now this slide is about a scheme we did for the um, suburbs that, um, that was commissioned by Time Magazine for their millennial issue a couple years ago. Given the chance to create its own ideal geography, to tell its own story about land use, America invented, as we all know, the artificial landscape of the parcelized frontier, or what we know of today as the suburb. Now the suburbs are both the test market and final resting point, I think, of architectural innovation. Their success makes them resistant to change, but also makes them the place where that change finally becomes ratified. This project here speculates on what could happen when the computer's encouragement of decentralization, that is, a virtual reality, for example, the emphasis on uh, physical space, the, the trends toward telecommuting, all this comes to the head, where this stuff meets the interest in environmentalism and greenness, uh, loathing of the sprawl that that would otherwise suggest or give rise to. So in our story, the story we told for this project, for Time Magazine, uh, uh, we told the story about the suburb of the future and then designed all the pieces for that future in this project. This project here proposes a sort of continuous carpet of inhabitation that's approximately about twice as dense as the existing suburban model but it confines all the building below the circulation datum um, so that the park-like nature of the original idea of the Garden City ideal is emphasized at this public level. The increased density allows for the provision of also a neighborhood sized strip of open space at the upper level of each group of 40 houses, uh, each group of 40 houses being one of those squares. So at each end of one of those squares on the left there, you would have a park the uh, entire length of it. Next. Below this sort of public datum, the courtyard houses provide uh, complete privacy, efficiently accessing just the right amount of outdoors and just the right amount of nature necessary to promote a sense of well-being and do this without intruding into the neighbor's perceptual field or having the neighbors kind of looking out their bathroom window into yours. There's a level of uh, separateness and privacy that really we understand as being the ideal of the suburban condition but is more or less lost now, particularly in this age of the pocket mansions that, that max out the lots in a typical suburban track. Each courtyard is designed for a microclimate adjustment 
using a balance of plantings and pond area uh, to promote uh, evaporative cooling and humidification. And the sliding doors that basically open continuously along the length of this thing to the uh, courtyard also would have, again, this is the future, a uh, liquid crystal, uh, a tunable liquid crystal uh, uh, sun shading type uh, 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 component to them. Next. In the space below the roads, which you can see in the uh, slide on the left there, which run at the, again, the roads are up at the public or rooftop level, lies the infrastructure for the tract, including energy, sewer, water, and data, along with access tunnels for that. Located under the roadbed pop proper is a rock bed thermal storage area, which supplies the ceiling and floor plenums in the adjacent houses with conditioned air either heated or cooled according to the season and the tuning of the road service itself, which we propose to be an active so solar, uh, um, uh, have an active solar surface to it. The access to each house is through this, um, is through the courtyard. Um, from the mobile stair you can see on the slide here on the left, or on your right, uh, no, your left, my right. Uh, and this uh, lift device here, that can be pedaled from one end to the other. You can't really see it in this slide, but you can see just maybe the handlebars, make out the handlebars there inside these, these railings here. This device here, which actually is also houses the, um, the dish array and the parking uh, area for the ELOVs there, um, uh, electric low occupancy vehicles that we also designed for this project. Um, uh, by pedaling it back and forth across the length of the site, you provide the resident with uh, exercise as well as mowing the lawn, mulching the trimmings, and supplying additional how, uh, power to the household batteries. Next. On the inside, the house is organized in such a way that it can provide all the program of a typical three-bedroom house uh, in less than half the space through the use of this uh, uh, Prodex system that you can see arrayed along the back there that we received a patent for a couple of months ago. Um, basically, and, and on the left there, you can see this is a slide cut at the lower level. So you can see how the, the house is basically divided in two pieces between an open area and uh, the Prodex system on the left there. Next. The Prodex is modeled on a uh, high density storage systems that you may be familiar with from lawyers offices uh, for uh, storage of books and papers and that sort of thing in which you use only the amount of space that you actually need and have the rest closed up uh, and this is sort of a critique of the amount of wasted space that you find typically in a suburban zoo of rooms type house that's built nowadays and this in this image as well you can see um, you might try uh, uh, focusing if possible. I don't, I can't do that. Generally, I, I feel like the slides on the left have been out of focus. Um, you can see basically each of these uh, components has a different element of the uh, a program within it. Um, and these would be, in our view of the future, marketed by various uh, companies that in the place of the furniture that they now provide to a typical house that would then populate the rooms. So you see on the left the, the um, AppleSoft Remember, this is the future. Uh, workstation. The next one over is a uh, uh, basically a surfing uh, simulator. Um, and then you'd have a Sears um, uh, Kenmore uh, bedroom module. I mean, a Sears uh, uh, bedroom module, a Whirlpool bathroom module, which unfortunately doesn't replace the toilet paper. Um, and then another Sears uh, bedroom module, and so on. And in the diagram on the left over there, you can get an idea of, of how many different modules you can get in there. And you recognize that you only have to open them up to provide the space needed at any one time. We've opened them up here beyond what they might normally be in order to illustrate the idea. Next. Now the general, there's a general sense to these days um, in which architecture is that which is always still. But a building is only architecture when it is moving. And architecture is profoundly invested in fixity and stillness. And this in turn moves us. 
Traditionally, movement threatens the authority and fixity, the certainty and control of architecture. Yet, architecture has historically been called frozen music, implying some sort of arrested motion in place in architecture. But what this really means is that architecture has historically, conventionally illustrated mo movement from Baroque uh, through Corbu to the blobs of today. Yet today, uniquely nowadays, architecture really can move. And we believe that the choreography of this movement can become another dimension for the architectural to consider. Our take on this though is not so much to celebrate this movement but to take it in stride. To say, no big deal, of course it can move. Architecture is a machine, machines move. And this is sort of a, you might say, an extension of uh, Bob Somel's rule, um, never let them see you sweat. Because what we like to think of architecture is sweating more to stay still than to relax into the movement that it should be able to enjoy nowadays. Next. The idea of, quote, a machine for living conjures a much different image today than that assumed, we think, by Le Corbusier. While Corbu chided the eyes which do not see for missing the lessons of the planes and the boats of his time, he never actually believed that buildings should intervene, though, as actively in the affairs of their occupants as these examples, that is the boats and planes, much less move like them. He was of course more interested in how they looked and the, the character, the mood evoked by them rather than the actual movement of these references. Next. The contemporary machine for living though, on the other hand, has the means to emulate those prior examples of Corbu on their own terms. I mean, think of it as a 747. A 747, or a 777 now, or a, you know, the, Air, the, the big new Airbus, these things are as big as buildings and as nicely appointed. Now, of course, they cost eight times as much as buildings. I mean, you, for a $125 million 747, you could get quite a few uh, little office towers like the one that we produced. But the point is, is now we have the ability today to emulate those, those kinds of examples on their own terms. And nowadays, this, this empowering flexibility can be achieved in our domestic architecture, for example, by repositioning more than just the furniture. Next. In this project, um, for a suburban, uh, a tract house in suburbia in uh, Redondo Beach, uh, the, ro the relocatable MOMO, or uh, 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 movable modular uh, units can link up with each other to create closer adjacencies or larger interior spaces or they can remain separate to give their occupants greater privacy and relief uh, from family life. Next. Each of the units is able to tune its relationship to the exterior represented on this particular lot over here by the pool, the garage, the work area, the grass, and the front porch on the opposite side that you can't see. But there are other options that might be available um, for these sorts of yard conditions that we would take as from the palette of possible uh, suburban um, surface conditions. Next. By their arrangement on the site, the Momo units are able to create either larger outdoor spaces um, or also, of course, eliminate them entirely. And they can allow light and air into any exposure of any of the units. The idea behind here actually began when we were uh, looking at uh, uh, siting this particular house in Redondo and realized that we had to ultimately make a choice about where the sun was going to be allowed to um, to, uh, into the interior of the site and finally the building. And it occurred to us that by freeing the building up to move, we would be able to uh, uh, solve that problem quite handily. Next. The reason, one way we're able to do this is by shrinking down the program that now inflates generally to fill the entire available envelope uh, on the site. By shrinking it down using these PRODEC um, uh, units, 
that, that, that I showed you previously on the suburb project. You can see these arrayed across here in the, um, in the explodo here, the exploded axo. Basically, each of the units is composed of two floors. Each of those is composed of a, a certain number of uh, prodec units accessed along one side. When the two units come together, the access space becomes more or less room-shaped, but when they're separated, the, the sense is that people want to be separate, and so they, they spend their time within the spaces with, inside the PRODEC units. Uh, and, like, and basically, these, these run along on the, clearly on the crane rail system that you can see there uh, with the festoon system that basically supplies all the uh, drainage and uh, services, uh, data, et cetera, et cetera, to the moving unit. All of this, of course, is, is, is quite conventional existing technology within under other reason. Under other arenas, maybe just a little unusual um, in, uh, in architecture. So anyway, by shrinking these things down, by using these means, we're actually able to create the space on the lot wherein these things could actually move and create the, the sense of flexibility and, um, and the, the, the variety of internal and external spaces that we're trying to trying to sell here that we would claim was the same as a house three times this size. Next. We had an earlier version of this in which it actually wrote to, uh, 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 slid the, the short direction of the site um, that we had taken in for review with the city uh, at the schematic phase, wisely it turns out. Um, where it was, of course, summarily rejected by the city. But not for any code or planning reasons, because they were very careful to constrain its movement to within the setbacks uh, and to follow all the codes, so all the handrail conditions and everything were worked out in various ways. Um, um, but it was in, they, they didn't even reject it for reasons of fear of people getting squashed or anything. But really, they, they rejected it for, as they put it in the end, because these are, this is the planning department, and they, they were concerned because they didn't really know at any time where these things would be. <laughs> Something, you know, obviously it's on the lot still. It's inside the setbacks. That should really be all their concern. But anyway, that's why. That was the, the reason they gave us. Next. Now, the Momo units could be decorated, we believe, with as great a variety um, of facades, let's put it, as the present suburban choice of, you know, Tudor, Spanish, French, um, or ranch. Of course, now all of this are just variables of the Mediterranean. And this here is our Tudor on the left over there. And the one on the, on the, uh, on the right, and the one on the left here is, uh, well, it's blue. Uh, Next. But it, you may have been able to tell by the, the preponderance of slides of this area that really the whole project was just an excuse for us to be able to model this festoon system, which we think is, is just really super cool. Next. By this we mean, this rule, we mean that the machine does not admit an author other than nature. Conceived as a, as a machine, the project does not really admit an author other than nature. And beyond that, the program, intention, or purpose that, that gets it going, that sets it in motion. But this is a great thing, we think, because then no author comes between the machine and its user. It creates in the machine what we call a peer figural relationship, like a near figural relationship you may have heard in a deconstructive context. A peer figural relationship where the object is set up as the interlocutor, as the direct peer, a peer relationship that you have with it. And through this directness we believe that the relationship is empowering and therefore inherently engaging. There's no, there's no signature architect or anything like that standing between you and the object. This modesty in the, in the architect's role there, we think is really a part of the architect's responsibility. Uh, given that the architect is obviously not there all the time to, to mediate between their, their object and the user group, 
it, it, uh, it behooves the architect, we think, to, to take themselves out of the equation, so to speak. So their personality, the personal flourishes they may be added into it, are not in the person's face, not there as a residue that the, that the user has to deal with all the time, but the user, doesn't, the user can just deal with the thing, the object there, without worrying about the architect. The signature architect has to actually suppress technology in, and, and make a, a technological adjustments in order to assert their authorship and stand in front of the object. And, we, and by that I mean to say that what we're proposing is this sort of pure figural relationship um, is actually the more natural condition. Next. We think this is the difference between using technology as a symbol and more visibly just being the technology. It's a difference between an expression in the work that arises from within technology rather than one that merely borrows technological form to illustrate some other non-technological interest. In, architecture, um, in architectural terms, this idea is best understood in the idea of vernacular buildings or vernacular machines. Next. Uh, this extensive uh, remodel of a former Aikido studio in Silver Lake uh, addresses for us the possibility of there being a vernacular account of technology in these terms. Now I have to apologize for the darkness of the next series of slides uh, because, well, it's painted black. Next. This is one of the problems with making a building black or really dark. And, and there was also a total eclipse of the sun the day we were taking the photography here. So, this project is really neither about the sort of flash of high tech, or as we call it, and pardon my French, haute tech, as in haute couture, nor, nor about the sh showiness of a strenuous critique. It's simply in our mind turns a machine's eye upon the opportunities and constraints of some, a particular residential program. Next. In this project, the original structure, as I, as, you, as I mentioned, was an Aikido studio, was leveled down to the retaining walls. It's a very steep site, and so on. Three sides of our fairly tall retaining walls. And the floor that originally uh, uh, divided it up into, th in, into two floors was removed on one side, creating a three-story volume. Um, uh, in the uh, plan on the uh, right over there, uh, on the right side of the vertical stripe where you see the stairs, the, the stair zone, you can see here principally in the slide on the left, uh, we basically created this three-story high volume by removing the floor here. And on the other side, the left side there, um, we created a stacked tier of the private spaces, the bedrooms, the bathrooms, uh, and their new garage uh, poked underneath. Next. In case you couldn't tell, there's a new steel structural system in it. And it holds these smaller spaces up, and it holds the retaining walls apart. That's what these uh, guys are going across, the tubes on the left there. Um, and there's this display shelving on either side of the three-story high space that's um, used for displaying drums. The resident was a drummer. He actually was a drummer for that, Berlin, that, that band from the 80s, Berlin. Unfortunately, he left the band right before they became really successful. But uh, in any case, uh, he's got an incredible collection of historical drums and he wanted to be able to display these. So we provided these shells, which was another way of basically activating the upper reaches of this three-story volume, which otherwise would just be a three-story volume. But in order to, what, what, to go back to that earlier rule about everything, every part having uh, 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 a reason and every, every part having a story, significance, the idea of conjuring functions in order to set up problems to solve through design. Once we put the shelves up there, we had to figure out a way to get there. So we devised this uh, moving uh, bridge here that is moves up and down on crane rails through the, the three-story high space there um, with a hand crank. It's got uh, handrails, guardrails that uh, can pull up uh, for enclosure or flop down to create a larger uh, 
surface. It also is a surface where he can uh, jam. Uh, you can see a, uh, that's an easy chair there on there, uh, or just hang out. And so you can crank it up from one end of the structure to the other, and it docks at either end too to create uh, a larger uh, mezzanine condition where the mezzanine is actually too small on either end. The, um, the big window there where you see the corrugated actually is a, um, uh, it's a, a, a one ton uh, double hung window that you can raise up and so when the, uh, the rolling uh, bridge crane uh, gantry surface there uh, docks at the far end you have a, a, a kind of outdoor deck when that's uh, opened up. Next. As I mentioned before the guardrails can be deployed horizontally. You can see it again in the slide on the left, your left over here and you're looking obviously from the stacked uh, support spaces into the three-story high volume there. Next. The privacy is achieved in this by the manipulation of these panels across the face of it, um, uh, just behind the stair circulation that are a combination of both opaque and translucent uh, wall panels in a, in a sliding rail system. And that same system can be used to tune the place acoustically uh, for when he's uh, recording or doing uh, performances in the space. Next. In this image you can see it's not quite a composite image, but you can kind of get a sense of the relationship between the private spaces, the master bedroom on the right over there, and the open space that's just out of it, uh, off to the side there, uh, on the left here, looking down into the main space. Here you can see the guardrail in the uh, upright, uh, or uh, the upright and locked position, uh, there uh, with the, uh, the chair and the, the moving uh, uh, bridge. Next. And this is, uh, this is the bathroom, uh, just your basic mechanical vernacular here. Uh, again, rethinking the functions in the bathroom uh, as excuses for creating uh, form. Next. Some things we've discovered in our practice are even more modest than the vernacular. And luckily the machine, or the machine as an idea, scales, like classicism actually, interestingly, from the doorknob to the city. And also, less like classicism, from the outhouse to the palace. So the machine allows you to scale the effort to the task uh, while remaining within uh, character, let's say. And this is good because some pro programs are admittedly more modest than others. Um, I don't know whether you remember from the very beginning sequence of spaces, the, um, the right away uh, ready mix example, which uh, originally was a much more elaborate design, um, which had won a PA award in its elaborate nature, um, but uh, had to be scaled back, not because of the budget, but because the space available to it was shrunk as they bought more trucks, couldn't fit the building on the site, so we had to scale back the building. And the, and the machine allowed us to do that without just cramming all the same amount of decoration in um, in less space, but to actually scale back the conception of the thing as well, yet remain within character. And the point behind this is to say that even the most modest programs can be taken seriously by the idea of the machine. Uh, I mean, look at the difference between the wedge and a space shuttle. They're, they're part of a continuum that runs all the way from one to the other, and where you can, you can make decisions, you can use the proper tool in all along that continuum. Next. This project was our first foray into development um, and it's two do doors down from the previous project in Silver Lake. Um, and it was something we, uh, this development idea was something that we hoped might be a model for a young small office to try to keep going without having to do marketing which we are really crappy at and, uh, and wasn't doing us any good anyway. So we're thinking maybe we just be our own clients and we start becoming developers, then we do our own stuff, we get to do whatever we want, et cetera, et cetera. 
obviously, or maybe it's not obvious, but it hasn't worked out that well. Development's hard. Buildings are, are more expensive than you think and they take longer to build and it's very easy to lose your shirt when you're doing them for yourself because as an architect, of course, you have those kind of arguments like in Fight Club where, uh, where you're arguing with the same person and the architect always wins in that case. Unfortunately, real life's not that way, which I guess is a, a way of saying that maybe this isn't real life. But this particular design was part of uh, our continuing experiment to introduce the loft idea into suburbia as an answer to the modesty of the means that you usually have there. That is, how could we get a sort of luxuriously big space that you never find in a typical pocket mansion Mediterranean monstrosity, uh, how could you get that into the same volume? Now in this particular project, uh, what we did was basically put three lofts together. We jammed all the functions, all the wet, the typical, another typical modernist wet core. We jammed all of the so-called private spaces into these cores that you see between each of the units there. Uh, and then we um, covered all of this with um, the kind of Death Star sliding panel system that would enable you to hide it all up and have the cleanest, simplest space. And in the middle of it, we slung a, uh, a, uh, a platform there that would be ostensibly the bedroom. And then hiding inside that wall are all of the other functions, including bathrooms, et cetera, et cetera. Which, when, since that was only three feet wide, gave rise to some interesting planning ideas in relation to the bathroom and the different components that went on there in which you would have to come out of the bathroom to get from one part to the other. But, you know, we figured these urban hipsters would live in something like this and, and it would all be cool. Um, but when we went to get this priced, we were kind of surprised, as I said, that this development thing didn't go that e easily for us. Uh, and it came in at like a million bucks. And maybe, maybe it was because it was that 45 sheet set that we made with all those three inch details. But, <coughs> You know, whatever. Uh, that was supposed to be a joke for all of you architects who know that the typical residential set's probably less than 10 sheets. Or at least that's what I keep trying to tell the office now. No more of these. They weigh the set. That's how they, they give you the, the price. But anyway, the, the long and short of this was we had to go back to the drawing board. Next. So maybe we overreacted. <laughs> but basically we thought, what is it, okay, screw that, what's the cheapest thing we can do? <laughs> so we thought, you know, we've been doing all these things with containers and they're really cheap, let's try and use those. So we, we took the same garage layout and it's actually um, worked out pretty well. It's less deep because we're not stepping up the hillside anymore because they're just stacked 20 foot containers. We made a triple stack of containers around a central open space and then we, we flipped them from one unit to the other facing in different directions. Next. And then, because we can't help ourselves, raise the budget again with all this fuzz. But it's fuzz that can get stripped away by the budget tornado. But we just can't ever keep ourselves from drawing it. So we took this into the city because we learned from the previous example with Redondo that you know you have to check with the city before you get too far with these things. And you know I guess it shouldn't have been a surprise but the city didn't buy this either. We had a meeting with them. Um, they had all their engineers there. I mean it was a pretty big deal. There were like seven or eight people in there, pretty high level guys, um, in which they produced a memo that the city of LA has all these memos that they never tell you about. But are the real codes, the real planning decisions are according to these memos. And they only whip them out when you transgress them. But you never know because they're not published anywhere. Um, so they whipped out this memo that says, you know, you can't use containers for human habitation. <laughs> so, so, but, but, you know, they were good enough to talk to us about it and why that was. And apparently there's this LA research report system. Well, not apparently. We all know about that. Um, in which containers didn't have a research report number. 
Uh, and a research report number is basically for all those prefabricated elements you bring on the site that the inspector in the field has to sort of take your word for that they're cool, that they work, that they're not going to fall down or whatever. So all the companies that make these things are supposed to, it's like underwriters uh, symbol, they're supposed to apply to the city, have these tests made and everything, pay the city lots of money for the privilege of having their product spec'd in LA. Now, one of the reasons that containers are so incredibly cheap is they're not built in the United States. Uh, and, you know, the standards, there is a standard, uh, uh, a set of standards for them, but the standards are not administered by people like underwriters laboratories and all. The standards are much, much, much more stringent than building codes uh, because they have to deal with movement, you know, tossing of ships at high seas, et cetera, et cetera. In fact, they're from three to eight times as strong containers are as what would be required for a similar structure by the building codes in terms of shear, dead load, live load, et cetera, et cetera. And the, 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 the containers are all tested for that and everything, but because the um, Bureau of Veritas, which does all this, is not licensed by the city of LA, you know, they don't accept this, these, 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 uh, these uh, uh, tests. You know, we had to basically send inspectors to China to inspect the welds that were being put on, that were, were being used on these. The inspectors had to see um, uh, uh, American welding manuals distributed around so that they'd have to get all the manuals translated. Anyway, so long story short, uh, we didn't go with this. Um, this was not, because of the city, the right tool for the job. Next. Okay, so that brought us to this, plan three. The city likes to see wood studs, stucco, they'll take corrugated. So this was really the cheapest thing we could build. I mean, down to the point where it's actually 20 feet high. I mean, in our misguided ideas, we made it 20 feet high so they didn't have to cut any lumber. But of course, that didn't work out well. It has the same garage, the same, um, it sort of has the same corrugated feeling as previously, the same massing as a container scheme, but not the same internal organization. Instead of sort of three stack containers around a triple height uh, uh, space. In fact, we have two, conven two relatively conventional floors, though the upper floor is much higher. But we basically packed all of the conventional living spaces, bedrooms and bathrooms and stuff on the lower floor. So the upper floor is just basically, uh, basically one big uh, open space. Next. Which you can uh, see in the, in the plan there on the right. An image on the uh, left here of how it would look from the back. And so there's also another corollary to this modesty idea in using the proper tool for the job, and that is something that we've actually been using for a lot longer, and the right-of-way example uh, holds here too, and that is using 90% of the architecture in 10% of the space. So we created a zone in the back here where we put all the fuzz. It's where all the steel is, all the HVAC, all the lighting, all the circulation, stairs, uh, sliders, movement, everything is confined to a five-foot zone. Well, actually, it's, it's about a 10-foot zone on the back of the building here. We turned a sort of a, a blank face onto the nasty street, Hyperion, there, which is uh, also very noisy. Um, it's a lesson we learned from the previous project here, where you notice that fiberglass there in the double-hung window, maybe, uh, that the client ended up putting in there after we finished the project because they were worried about people looking in from across the street and uh, uh, into the interior of the space. But all of this is also, including the graffiti, actually also a response to the uphill neighbors uh, who came to our variance hearing because this area, this area is actually down zone to a 0.5 FAR, which is of course absurd. So we applied for a variance to get it up to one, which is still 0.5 less than conventional housing. But all our neighbors came out to speak, against, speak out against us and said, not only that, but on top of it, we don't want to see any of this mechanical stuff or anything. So we put, we decided since we won the variance, uh, to put all the ugly mechanical stuff on the uphill side so they could enjoy it. <laughs> Next. And this one, in fact, we're actually building. No, unfortunately, it's eight months behind. But it will be finished in, in two weeks. On the, on the right there, you see the interior of the upper space there in, in an earlier, simpler space it's a, stage. It's actually a lot more gorped out with fuzz there in the 10% uh, of the architecture zone because we've taken the ducts that you saw on the ex exterior in the previous and moved them into the interior in that zone there. And here you can see a kind of in-progress uh, production 
slide, just to basically show that we're doing it finally more than to celebrate the resulting architecture, at least at this stage. Next. And this is the last set of projects I'll be showing. Now, despite our apparent obsession with the workings of stuff, we think that it's a, it's a rule that one shouldn't always design the links. Now, we believe that the mechanical is the best source of effectively open, non-cultural, and non-political legibility or meaning in form making. But it has a certain rep as being overly deterministic. And, uh, you know, it's received a lot of criticism for that. But there are nuances of legibility within the mechanical that can open it up further. And one way of that, one way of doing that is well, what we say to obscure the links. Now Leonardo's, and to illustrate this, Leonardo's um, uh, description of uh, the Mona Lisa's facial expression. Uh, he actually left all of those characteristic ticks, shadows, um, points of definition that would clue the reader into what her expression really was. He sort of blurred the edges a little bit. And by virtue of that, he created the kind of enigmatic look that's been become celebrated throughout history. And in that, he draws the reader into speculating about what she's thinking. He draws the reader into providing the answer to the question of what her expression really is. And it's been speculated um, that by, by uh, psychologists of uh, a vision, um, that it is the, uh, the activity of supplying this information, of completing the gestalt or whatever there, that gives to the object its depth, its vibrancy, its plasticity and brilliance. It's the energy that we expend in creating this constancy of form um, that, uh, that makes the thing uh, come alive for us. And this is an idea that we believe can be applied within the mechanical uh, metaphor that we're, we're talking about here um, in the same way. This particular project for a, um, a single family residence in San Clemente in a gated community uh, down there uh, is, a, is an example of this, where clearly the thing is rotating and all, but we've kind of suppressed the mechanisms of rotation, whereas on some of the other schemes you have seen and will see in a few seconds, we have explicitly um, indicated those mechanisms because we actually intend to make it rotate and build. In this case, it's just going to be fixed in space. This is another one of the long line of projects that we've had, though, that's been rejected by design review boards because in this case they didn't accept our argument that this terracotta coloration made it Mediterranean, <laughs> which their, their uh, rules required it to be. Next. Another way this idea of openness can be worked into the machine in terms of not designing the links is, um, is thinking of it as a function of the space not filled in by the designer. Uh, and that's, that, that has been behind a lot of our uh, latest container schemes, of which the second Silver Lake project I showed you previously, the orange ones, um, was an example. But it all started here in this, um, uh, which was a project for uh, ca cabins up in Hope Valley, up in the Sierras, where the container came to us as a solution to a problem of mobility which is also, in fact, another, another sort of openness. We had to be able, in that project, to airlift these, these things in. Next. In this later project, uh, done for the uh, Rotterdam Biennale, uh, and then canceled when the director pulled out and they brought in a new director who eliminated all the previous programs, the, most, the mobility that we were achieving and, and therefore openness in the container was both actual and virtual. Yeah, this was a series. This was a, a proposed to be one of the many objects that would be distributed throughout the city. Um, it, it was called by the organizers a stim, which is short for stimulation. It, it was actually coined by Lars Lerat, uh, and it's and it's all about a, a 
some kind of European mix of buzzwords related to spaces of flows and stimulant dross and this sort of thing. Uh, but basically what we created here next was a, a core sampler of the space of flows uh, in which um, basically the, 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 the container would come into the port of Rotterdam, be taken out, put into the site, uh, and then all this material here would slide out. This is an explodo. It would slide out like it is on the right over there. And what would happen is that the container and this nose looking thing on the left were uh, uh, projection spaces with projectors on the end and they projected onto these surfaces you see here, these screens, and you would walk into the middle there and these projections would be coming at you on both sides and because of the depth we were able to, able to create stereoptic um, space. So there was a, a three dimensionality uh, to the projections and this was, the projections could be anything, but what we were thinking of is it was like a, a virtual elevator that would take you anywhere on Earth. And we would put cameras in remote places on Earth, pointing in the two directions so you would be able to visit these uh, spaces. And, and, and we proposed uh, that, that, you know, this was somehow sampling uh, the, the possible spaces of electronic flows and you could go in there and there'd be a dial and you could switch back and forth between different areas. But anyway, next. That, that never happened either. This here is, this, is the smallest divisible unit of uh, the container idea that's capable of this leaving this space, uh, leaving some room as the rule indicates. Uh, basically two containers and the space in between. This particular project is a house for a hacker house for Neo we called it, uh, that lives parasitically on top of the rooftops in uh, San Francisco. This was also a, a dot-com inspired uh, project um, and uh, has been therefore put on hold. But basically the idea was is you'd lift this thing on, uh, it would live on the dunnage and the roofs there that otherwise would hold up uh, billboards and you would, you would lift these things in and this particular one has a slewing ring that would allow it to turn 360 degrees. Uh, and you would live parasitically off of the building infrastructure that was there. Hence, you can see all the cables and all there. Next. And in between the space um, uh, becomes the sort of site for most of the design, charged with all of the energy that the user himself can display. And so we made, because it's a hacker, uh, we made all of the surfaces inside their glare, uh, 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 glass in order to present ourselves with the problem of requiring uh, to, uh, us to block them out, giving us the excuse to create these rolling screen, screens that you might have, you, you might remember from the previous slides. They would be able to roll around. You could have different surfaces printed on them to keep the sun out, like uh, uh, images of uh, tree branches or uh, logos or whatever. Uh, and, and these could be positioned uh, throughout the day in, in different uh, locations. And the glass floor allows you to see the really cool slewing ring underneath. But basically the idea again behind that is in addition to leaving the space for the guy to or, or a woman to basically inhabit as, as they like, um, we create a problem for ourselves to solve through, through design, uh, a function. We conjure a function and then becomes an opportunity to tell a story and, and suggest how every part counts. Next. Now, uh, this is basically the intro to a series, a short series of slides about our ProCon or program container idea that was built around this particular system and that particular object. Uh, basically, the idea is that uh, you, would in, you would bring into suburbia this crane system that you saw in the Momo project, but in this case, in this case it would be generalizable. And these would pro provide a kind of foundational infrastructure for a, the possibility of uh, a, a system that used uh, containers as primary building blocks of uh, a building system. This entire project is a reaction. And so we devised this crane system that could also come in on a truck, be, be deployed, and then you would bring in the containers as well. And this system would ride on the rails that would serve as the, as the uh, foundation for the containers and be able to position the containers on, deep into the site there. And as I was saying, this, this particular project of ProCon was uh, proposed as a reaction to the ideas of mass customization and continuous differentiation that are um, 
that are uh, so much in the air these days. Uh, in fact, you know, that's kind of where we started. We, 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 were, we were basically invited to participate in this show at the Hammer that was um, where the, when the Unprivate House show came out uh, west and all the UCLA faculty that didn't get invited to the East Coast Unprivate House show decided to throw their own show. Um, and we were part participated in that. Um, because of the situation there and everything, you know, there was a certain formalism that was being advanced. And we decided, okay, what's the ultimate box that we could throw up against the blob? We came up with a container and decided to investigate this idea in reaction to the, um, to the idea of mass customization that is being proposed in, in uh, the blob formalism. Next, or through the medium of that. Now, just to quickly uh, uh, go through the mass customization idea combines, uh, you all probably know the economic benefits of mass production with the custom fabrications opportunity to have it your own way. And there are two strategies in this. Basically, there's a built-to-order idea in which a wider than usual but still finite um, array of menu-driven choices is given to the user or, or uh, 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 consumer. Or there's an idea of auto, what I would call autographic choice, which the, in which the consumer or customer's um, uh, random or gestural commands are translated directly into unique components within a standardized framework. Uh, uh, so far in, in either of these, basically performance is a criterion only where issues of fit are concerned, like in sports equipment. Um, you could say that the shoe sizing is an example of mass customization in the first case, and now the new websites where you can further customize your shoes uh, beyond that would be an example in the second, even though they don't use milling machines. Now the problem for us with the idea of continuous differentiation as a way of achieving mass customization is that it pursues a vanishingly fine modularity. Continuously differentiated spaces describe a prescriptive and thus ultimately static environment with no possibility of post-construction alteration or customization, at least within conventional technology nowadays. In addition, Despite interest in empowering the user through this, the control has remained, for the most part, firmly in the hands of the architects. So the chief beneficiary of such customization and all the elaborate technology that goes along with it has been the designer rather than the user. Uh, here on the, on the right there, you can see some looming mass customization trying to continuously differentiate our, process, our project beyond it. Next. So we said, instead of the stiflingly tight fit of continuous differentiation, we might propose a strategy of loose modularity um, that would support a program of liberation from within the mass production ethos. Such a strategy we offered um, falls between a sort of creeping absolutism of continuous differentiation and the fixed universe of choice that occurs only within the parameters of a proprietary menu, proprietary menu uh, driven uh, design uh, system. Next. In our system, there are basically two components, the containers and then the space between. The system is activated or engaged via a website that we designed at, uh, at which uh, the, um, the containers themselves would be selected leased and per or purchased or traded. They would be arranged and ultimately paid for. The system is basically one in which uh, standardized program specific containers could be flexibly assembled and reassembled into, into multiple configurations. And then the interstitial connective tissue, the space between, remains unprogrammed or free space to be filled in or left open by the user who buys the uh, or the owner as, uh, who buys the uh, containers as they desire. They can use local contractors for that. We might offer several packages for infilling that system. But the point is, is that basically it's only the containers themselves that would be offered through the system and, and the user would be responsible for filling in the spaces in between them. 
So in that way, like the Mona Lisa smile, the user is drawn into completing that space and making it more plastic and, and alive and vibrant. Now the first step in that is the website, as I mentioned. And in this case, the first step of that is where the preferences are specified to tailor the menu of choices that, that would be offered to you in the next steps. Next. As you can see here again, you would go from there and then you would begin, you would be offered a certain number of choices based on your, your, um, the, the budget that you uh, put in and so you might be shown Sub-Zero or you might be shown Kenmore, uh, et cetera, et cetera. Loose modularity preserves the openness in, in this scheme by admitting a sort of unmandated difference. So, and, and that's through the choice and arrangement and the extent and the variety of the highly factored but ultimately non-proprietary modules. That is, again, as I mentioned, it's only the container standard that's maintained and that all, all the rest of the thing is totally fair game for the various vendors that are participating. So when I say non-proprietary, proprietary, that, that means that we don't design any of the containers, we basically create an infrastructure within which people like Sub-Zero or Ikea or whatever would design their own Procon or program containers. Next. Now unlike systems of mass customization that sees the home's uniqueness to be primarily formal, this idea of loose uh, modularity pins the uniqueness almost entirely on performance. And this starts, of course, with the arrangement of the chosen units. And the user is actually able to participate at that level as well. Now, it would be possible also, next, uh, they, could, they could go through the various uh, ways of configuring these on the website, or there would be a link to various architects they could ask to do it, or the in-house experts, the technical support staff that could suggest various arrangements. You can see on the right, these are the brands of the containers that have been chosen as a key to the containers as they're arranged there, so you know where your bathroom is, where your workstation is. And then there's a kind of a running total of the modules that you've chosen, a, a, a uh, issue of how complex is the arrangement that you've made that's factored in, and finally you get the, um, the, uh, the total there. Next. And then the arrangements are made for delivering it via that uh, system that I described earlier uh, to your site. In a lumpy system, what we call this loose modularity, we call it lumpy logic or a lumpy system, as opposed to uh, continuous or continuously differentiated. Uh, the most difficult and complex elements are fabricated in the factory, while the rest is left for assembly in the field. Rather than wish that seamless continuum from the factory to the finished installation, uh, which is always impossible to achieve, or at least frustrating when you finally get out there and try and put this stuff together in the field, the, the lumpiness, the lumpy logic allows the gaps to remain. And the only tolerances that are stipulated, are the, the only tolerances are those that are stipulated by the container industry's corner block and all the infrastructure that goes along with that. Next. And these gaps that remain between the containers permit a sort of literal and figural movement during design, during construction, and finally during the occupancy. And, and of course, as I, as I mentioned, there's a huge infrastructure that's developed for the connections between these containers and the way they allow movement and restrict movement and for the various abilities uh, and ways of arranging these containers. And this entire infrastructure could be appropriated for use by the building industry in, in a proposal like this. Next. Get a little focus there on the left. Since the spaces between are filled on site, according to the project requirements, they remain technically independent of the factory produced lumps. And this secondary construction can adjust to accommodate the relative permanence of the particular arrangement. The system is designed and the infrastructure exists within the container industry to actually remove containers from lower in the stack, from the side, so that the indeterminate nature of the a matrix of gaps between the containers that is facilitated by all this infrastructure. That's really what we're, we're, we're kind of focusing in on with this system. That's what makes this system different than other modular type building block sorts of system. It distinguishes the lumpy strategy from 
um, from other approaches to mass customization or modularity uh, far more than the actual use of the containers themselves. So again, to reiterate, the point is here, it's not the object module in this case, but the spaces they leave that's the key to, to, the, to the system here. Next. So in the end, lumpiness avoids a sort of, at the same time, the systematized flexibility that we know from the history of, uh, of modernism's attempt to make this actually happen can become as stifling and as inflexible as the, uh, the, the, the rigid systems that it's trying to uh, replace, either the um, form-based efforts of continuous differentiation or the finite palette of the uh, built-to-order equivalent. Next. Yeah, I thought so. So finally in the end, I obviously was out of sequence there. There's a, a lumpy system does not view the house as a finished product, but as a continuous negotiated collection of products and their accommodation. The customization is not exhausted in the initial purchase or fabrication, or even in the design, however unique that might be, but continues through the transformation of the initial choice of, uh, in the mass of choices that will come out after after as the units are upgraded or traded out as the composition of the family changes and you change your your Game Boy module for a uh, you know a Martha Stewart sewing module you know the kids move away etc cetera, etc cetera. and the point is, is to through a system like this to encourage people to imagine that they continuously they can continue to be in charge of their own environment and change it out in that way without being necessarily slave to any system because they're still also in charge of the spaces in between. And I believe that's it. Thank you. Now that was intended as a provocation, so I hope there are questions and, and lights.